what I like to do is to, is to sing and have a wild time. If I get out and do that again on my own, people can't judge me. If they don't like it, too bad. Whatever happens, I don't want to dwell. I don't want to wait two years. I want to make a solo record. I want to do it right now. I signed a deal with Mushroom, uh, Mushroom Records, and uh, I just wanted to get in the studio. I wanted to put it down. I didn't want it to be polished. I wanted it to have all the warts and scratches and, and, and just throw it out there and let people say, this is my first, you know, this is where I'm starting from. Have I got something going here or not? the album out and lo and behold it went to number one. And there was such a huge expectation on Jimmy after he'd left Cold Chisel that um, it was a very exciting time and uh, really it just felt like um, you know the world was his oyster. I suddenly realised that I was, Christ I've got to try and you know do this you know again now I've got to keep it up I've got to do you know put shows on. It was awesome I suddenly you know I felt you know at least I had the confidence that I I felt I can do this without the, the sort of safety net of Cold Chisel because I never thought I could do anything without the, the rest of cultures around me. We just depended on each other that much. And I guess that was really the start of, a, of an incredible era in the sense that uh, the album went straight to number one first week. Uh, no second prize. I still rate as one of uh, Jimmy wrote it. It, it just was it's a, real, a, a real anthem that came from that whole body swerve record. And I guess from there on... Um, Mushroom Records and Jimmy Barnes had a, a phenomenal relationship. Five more number one albums followed, creating a record six consecutive number one solo albums. He was uh, larger than life, as you'd expect, and uh, you know there, were, there was, a, I guess, an expectation for things to be done a certain way. And uh, in a lot of ways, money wasn't an object in terms of uh, lifestyle or you know recording budgets or video uh, concepts. That, that just had to be bigger, better, bolder, louder than anything that had been done previously. And uh, if ever there was anyone that was going to make it that way, it was Jimmy, I guess. Jimmy's second solo album would give audiences the great working class anthem. It came about through a collaboration with American Jonathan Cain. Jonathan and I hit it off really well. He was in a band called The Babies, who was, I was a fan of The Babies. And he, he said, I've written this song about your audience. And, you know, and so, you know, he played me a demo, or a rough demo uh, on the piano of, uh, of uh, Working Class Man. And I just thought the song was great from the, from the minute I heard it. Uh, you know, and I, you know, I love the fact that it was, it was, it's not about, you know, it wasn't about me, it was about my audience. He just built up a real synergy with the, that sort of, and I mean, the working class man was the perfect song in that sense that he really came up with, you know, hard yakka. You know, Jimmy Barnes was and lived and did everything that that sort of genre of the Australian, you know, male would want to be, and Jimmy Barnes was that. And it wasn't a fake thing. He really was that. Album, Freight Train Heart was to be his big push into the States. But as was the case with Chisel previously, American success was not to be. The American record company really got involved heavily, you know, with, uh, you know, because I was there, I was recording it all there. I was sort of, uh, uh, they really sort of thought this was the one they were going to mold me to, to suit America. And, and once again, it was, you know, there was certain things you've got to do for that to work and, and, and certain things that I wouldn't do. 
I mean, when I made the record, I, I, I think Freight Train Heart's a really good record. And I had this band that, wanted, that all wanted to play with me. I had Tony Brock, you know, who was an incredible drummer. I had, uh, you know, Randy Jackson, one, you know, who never was sick of being on the road, wanted to join my band and come on tour. The record company and the management sat me down and, and said to me, um, you know, you can't have any black people in your band because, uh, you know, middle America won't accept it. And I, and I just flipped. I said, you've got to be, you know. And they went, oh, it's okay to have them on your record, you know. And I just, I went nuts. And I, I, you know, and I basically, you know, told Geffen to, to, you know, shove it at that point. At the same time, I was trying to finish mixing the album. Uh, uh, Gary Gersh, who'd, who'd been, like I said, had been a great ally to me and, and had learned a lot from Gary. Uh, he, um, he, he made this thing where he told me, he said, um, he said to me, uh, uh, um, I want you to have a meeting. We'll have a meeting with a guy who's going to mix your album, but I want you to come in first. I want to talk to you about a couple of the songs. So I went there early and I got, went into his office and he said to me, this is all in a, in a period of a few days. He said to me, uh, he said, oh, there's this one song on your record, uh, Lessons in Love. It's not going to make the record. It's not good enough. And I said, look, I think you're wrong. I said, I think it's, you know, we need more rock songs on the record. There's not enough rock on it. I want more rock. That's staying on there. He said, look, I don't want to talk about it. We'll talk about it later. Such and such is outside, uh, you know, Terry Manning, who at that point was going to mix the record. Uh, we'll talk to him and see what he thinks, you know. We'll, you know we'll, we'll talk about this later. So Terry walks in, and, and Terry had been given the, the sort of roughs of the album to listen to. And the first thing Terry said was, I really like that song, Lessons in Love. I think that should be the first single. And Gary Gersh he turned around and just said to me straight away, he said, yes, I was just saying the same thing to Jimmy. And I just stood up and I said, you lying bastard. You know? <laughs> How dare you? And I just, I, I said, I can't work with you. You're, you're sickening. And I got up and basically I took my ball and left. And you know, I packed up the tapes, uh, walked out, went to a hotel, packed my bags. I was supposed to be in L.A. for a month to mix. I picked up... My wife and my mother-in-law were at the, the, the Sunset Marquee. So they just checked in, and uh, my kids and, uh, and I packed everybody up, went to the airport, went to Australia, and took the album with me and finished it in Australia. Um, and so that was the end of the Geffen deal. <laughs> that was the end of America for me, basically, with, with Geffen. I guess looking back on my own career, um, that's one of the frustrations for me, is that um, I was never e ever able to really crack through with Jimmy in America and... Uh, you know, it still disappoints me to this day and uh, I just know, I guess, how much easier it would have made life in, in his whole, uh, the whole way, you know, it worked. Turning his back on the US had no effect on his local appeal. Barnstorming and Two Fires both went to number one and then came the surprise hit of 1991, Soul Deep. I gotcha! Uh-huh! Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Soul Deep was a, was a record that was actually, it was one of those things where, uh, you know, I'd been working with Don Gaiman for a couple of records. Don was a, is an incredible producer from America. We'd become close friends, his family and mine. And, and we, we used to say, it'd be great to make a record of all those tunes that you just like to play, you know, just for fun. And, uh, and uh, I remember I'd finished a tour and Don Gaiman was actually coming out to spend Christmas with us just for a holiday. So I said to Don, I said, look, you're here, all the band's here, we're just, we're just hanging around, having a good time. Uh, why don't we do that record we spoke about just for fun, you know? And we just, we'd pick songs that we loved. Do you like that? Yeah, let's play it. it sounds good. That's on the record. That's good. Uh, so we made this thing and, uh, and we, by the time we finished it, we thought it was really good. And I remember we presented it to, uh, to, to Michael, to Gadinsky. Michael's going, no, I don't want to release it yet. Uh, and he stalled and stalled and, you know, six months down the track because he, he was freaking out that I'd made a, a, a soul record and, and two, a record of covers and he thought it was an, a, a formula for disaster and he thought, you know, people are just going to, you know, I just had, you know, all these albums in a row of number ones and he thought it's going to wreck it, the, the, the run. At the time I thought, man, how many different ways are we going to change what we're doing here? We've just got everything going in the right direction here. Do we need to go... You know, off into another shoot and in hindsight Jimmy was right on the money. In the end we sort of forced him to release it. I don't think any of us realised uh, the success of Soul Deep. In fact Soul Deep was most probably Jimmy's biggest album of all time.